So far, things have been better for Ukraine than previously expected. A, a fierce response to this invasion, people picking up arms, doing everything they can to protect their homeland. Is that true or is Putin really just not turned up the heat yet? You know, I do think some of that bears out. Um, but to your point, there is still probably at least a third as of this morning of the Russian ground troops not even yet deployed into the country. And that may uh, that may have changed uh, over the course of the day. And what I think we're seeing, too, is almost a little bit of this emotional roller coaster as people were surprised by the mobilization of Western Europe, unity around sanctions and some of those pieces. So I think that has created an outlook that I'm afraid we're going to feel very different about in 48 or 72 hours as the reality, right, that sanctions don't stop tanks kind of sets in for all of us here. Mm, yeah, the, <laughs> sanctions don't stop tanks. That is the unfortunate reality. Um, as far as the sanctions go, are we doing enough? Are we doing too much? Should we continue down this road? How do you how do you how do you look at that? From my perspective, I think the risk calculus is in not going far enough. And I entirely understand, by the way, that um, the Western leaders are dealing with in an already sensitive economic situation. How much pain are we willing to inflict on our own populations? Because the reality is biting sanctions in a global economy are going to hurt everybody. Mm. Right. Uh, punish Russia the most, but there will be those after effects. And so I think if we're going to implement those things, I don't see what we're waiting for. Russian forces have encircled the capital. They're going to try to decapitate the head of state. Bring it all out now. I don't think that we'll look back and say, hey, you know, we needed to wait that extra week or two to ratchet things up. I think that that's an incorrect risk calculus. How, how much of this, Jason, do you think is – you know, maybe we want to go forward with more sanctions and, and go further, f farther and farther. But some, you know, some other NATO members are hesitant to do that. And we're trying to walk this impossible line. Yeah, I think that, Stu, an important thing to think about there is not only what else will Europe agree to, but how for how long. Right. So we see all these announcements. Uh, this soccer match is canceled here or this other event is canceled here. But ne neither of us would be surprised if in a couple of months we start to see those events quietly get put back on the schedule mm. and and the aerospace rights quietly sort of be restored. And so I think it remains to be seen how firm Western Europe's commitment will be after the immediate shock of this invasion has taken place. And, and, and I want to make a point here, which is Vladimir Putin went in to Georgia. He went into Ukraine already. He's got a strategic foothold in uh, Syria at a port where they've had a lease for 40 plus years, but but more presence there in the past decade. Um, now back into Ukraine, intervention in Kazakhstan, that was two or three months ago. This is somebody who is deliberately working their way uh, west, deliberately expanding their footprint. And that's how we need to think about it. Vlad marches west. Mm. So what is... His end game. We're, that's kind of the, the theme of the show today. Where does this all lead? What is he trying to do here? Where is he going to stop? Is he going to stop? Does he stop before the NATO line? Does he go past that? Where do you see this going? Yeah, good question. I am a believer in taking these leaders at their word. So when he says that the greatest geopolitical mistake or, or tragedy of the past hundred years of the last century was the fall of the Soviet Union, that tells me he wants to reestablish that degree of control. And it looks like up until a week or so ago, that was in installing smaller scale client regimes, right? And, and declaring quote unquote autonomy and then sending even heavier quotes, peacekeepers to these places. Mm. Um, I think that's gonna be the continued model. Um, it is taking chunks of sovereignty from these countries, and there are several other examples of countries that may be vulnerable to this, right, where they have Russian-speaking populations. And I think Putin will continue to move west. He might slow, but if we look at it in a historical pace, uh, it's not that slow. 
Is this sort of like a hole in the model of NATO where he can just say, in theory, hey, you know, Lithuania really wants us. There's a lot of Russian speakers there. We're, we're going to recognize the independence of that region. And it's not an attack in theory on paper from Russia, but it, it serves as one. Yeah, it, it is a hole. And, and the reason is because the rhetoric that Putin uses to justify the movements, we don't believe our Western European partners don't believe, and it's not even clear that Putin believes it. What, what lies underneath that is the reality that hard power is how these things have been decided. And again, in Georgia and Ukraine, now back to Ukraine, um, their control over the Black Sea. Um, what we're really seeing is a NATO unwilling to use certain uh, tools in the toolkit and a Putin who is willing, and that's why he gets the last word. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe to our channel so you'll be sure to see similar videos from Blaze TV with the added bonus of signaling YouTube that your voice and opinion still matters. And if you're looking for more great conservative content, check out one of the two videos suggested here. And let's go, Brandon.